Good evening. I'm your host, Karen Hudis. This show is a series that has been coming to you from DCTV since May in a weekly program called the Network of Global Corporate Control. Today's program is called World Bank Whistleblower for Dummies. DCTV is a public access network. When the law for cable TV was passed in 1972, the citizens fought very hard and won the right to allow the public to tell their stories alongside the cable TV companies. Carmen Stanley, Mo Jackson, and Kofi Tendai have been helping me to tell my story here at DCTV. DCTV has been training me to be a TV producer, videographer, and now I'm starting to learn editing. I'm also a lawyer and an economist. I represent 188 ministers of finance and development on the Board of Governors of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, which is located in Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, the World Bank is Washington, D.C.'s biggest employer. The World Bank and International Monetary Fund were created in 1944 at the end of World War II. The World Bank and IMF are very special organizations. The World Bank and IMF are also called the Bretton Woods Institutions, named for the ski resort in New Hampshire where 44 nations met and put the ministers of finance in charge of the world's wealth. They kept it secret that that's what they were doing because they intended to bring all of the world's hidden wealth out after 50 years. That is what we are doing. We're converting the world's paper money to money minted out of the world's hidden gold reserves. The Board of Governors agreed to do this on the 12th of April, 2014. How do the people who rule the world rule the world? They do this through corporations, which don't have to tell you who owns them or who they really are. The Dutch East India Company was established in 1602. It was the second corporation in the world. The first corporation was the British East India Company. The world's corporations are really just one corporation, and they have been created in corporations out of the world's countries and even their governments and their cities and towns. They also are creating corporations out of the world's people. When babies are born, they set up a company and give that company the name of the baby. They use all capital letters. And then they estimate how many taxes that baby is going to pay over its lifetime. They create a bond and float that bond on the world's capital markets and earn money on this bond. In Switzerland in 2011, three mathematicians, Vitali Glatfelder and Battiston, of the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich showed the existence of the network of global corporate control. But you see, people are really more than they appear at first blush. We're going to learn who we really are and what we really are capable of doing in the global currency reset. I'm an ordinary person. But luckily for everyone who's working with me, and that is everybody, I'm extremely stubborn and I'm extremely transparent. That's a nice way of saying that I'm a blabbermouth. I have always been that way. As a matter of fact, one of the problems when people try to bribe me is I tell everybody that I've just gotten an offer and then you can't accept the bribe that way. I come from a middle-class family. My mother was a principal of an elementary school. My father was a small businessman, and he became the president of the D.C. Grocers Association one year. I used to work in his grocery store. When I was 14, I got my first job in the Grand Union's bakery shop. I was working on the donut machine. I became a union member, and one of the things that I did as a union member 
was I worked together with the other employees in the Grand Union, and we prevented the Grand Union from firing another member of the Union who was in her 60s. I thought that was old when I was 14. I learned shorthand in my teens and worked my way through college and graduate school in Holland as a temporary secretary for many years. As a matter of fact, I used shorthand one year in the World Bank when the uh, staff association gave me something to read. They told me I couldn't copy it. So I just used shorthand and transcribed it. I blew the whistle at one job in Holland for the Coffee Traders Association when I saw they were polluting a local stream. I graduated from New York University and became captain of the fencing team. I learned fencing from a Hungarian fencing coach, Bela de Chiagi. You could say that between 1995 and 2005, when James Wolfenson was president of the World Bank, it was just one big fencing match. The Board of Governors of the World Bank know me very well because I worked at the World Bank for 20 years before I was fired for exposing corruption. I bought a World Bank bond and settled my lawsuit in 2012. I am attaching the statement that I sent to the Board of Governors that has won the right of the world's people to be free from the giant corporation that thinks it runs the world. And I will read from that open letter to the Board of Governors at the end of this video if there's still time. So the Board of Governors kept on testing me to see if I was working for anybody else but them. They found out I was only working for them, I'm loyal, and I will not do anything that anybody asks me to do unless the Board of Governors agrees. So the Board of Governors has now appointed me to be the Overseer Mandate tr Trustee over the world's wealth. The global currency reset is going to be done in the open in the sunlight. The local currencies are going to be even more important than the gold currencies in each country. We do not have a one world government. Nations have sovereignty. But there is one thing I'm going to be meddling in. I'm going to be making sure that nobody is punished for being a whistleblower. I'm going to be very hands-on involved in making sure that this is the way things are. That is going to be my job from here on out. There's a rule called the statute of limitations, which says that if you don't succeed in proving your case, that you own something, after 50 years, you don't own it anymore. And this means that nobody owns the wealth in the trust that is managed by the Board of Governors of the World Bank and IMF, except the world's peoples, not the Dragon family, not the indigenous peoples, not nobody, everybody is a beneficiary of this trust. Nobody is above anybody else, not one country, not one people, not nobody. Who created the World Bank and IMF? Jose Rizal, who was then the Black Pope, that's the Superior General of the Society of Jesus. The Black Pope is above the Pope. Today's Black Pope is Adolfo Nicholas. There's also a Grey Pope who is Pepe Orsini. He's also above the Pope. The Grey Pope is elected from the bloodline families who stretch back from the Holy Roman Empire to ancient Egypt. These family are Orsini, Breakspear, Aldo Brandini, Farnese, Somaglia, all are controlled through the Jesuit order and their Knights of Malta and Teutonic Knights, all based in missile protected Borgo Santo Spirito in Rome. Pepe Orsini in Henry Breakspear in Macau. Jose Rizal intended for the people of the world to get back their wealth from these hidden rulers who used secret societies as puppet masters. This is the Guelph and the Ghibelline power over mankind. The Cecil family were controlled by the powerful Jesuit family known as the Pallavincini. Maria Camilla Pallavincini is far more powerful than Queen Elizabeth II. The Queen and Prince Philip are totally subordinate 
to the, to the papal bloodline, the Breakspear family, and their Jesuit UK headquarters at 114 Mount Street. Please go and study who funded Elizabeth II. The world's wealth has always been held in the secret trust and it has had many, many names. Start enjoying the world's felt wealth, folks, because it's ours. And now I'm going to start reading you the letter that I wrote to the National Advisory Council on International Monetary and Financial Policies and to the Securities and Exchange Commission. The Senate and House of Rep Representatives intended to protect persons who assist the legislature in oversight of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development against retaliation and the employee protection provisions of Title VIII of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, Section 806, repealed the World Bank's temporary exemption from the U.S. securities laws. In 2005, the Joint Economic Committee of the United States Congress advised that it was necessary for the World Bank's professional financial and accounting employees to have independent access to the World Bank's board and its audit committee. The World Bank's financial and accounting employees do not have access to external arbitration as required by the Lugar-Lehi Amendment. In March 2009, GAO stated, that's the Government Accountability Office, stated that it could not commence an inquiry to determine whether the World Bank's programs are being hampered by internal resistance to increased transparency and accountability commissioned on May 14, 2008, quote, because of challenges we recently faced in gaining access to World Bank officials, close quote. The World Bank's capital increase is conditional upon a package to be submitted at the end of June to the Board of Governors for approval. With global mandates and memberships, the World Bank Group must play key roles in a modernized multilateralism. We look forward to board proposals for strengthening corporate governance and accountability at the World Bank Group at the 2010 annual meetings. We urge the boards and World Bank management to expedite the necessary procedures so the appropriate resolutions to implement the voice reform and capital packages are submitted to the World Bank and IFC Board of Governors by the end of June 2010. The Securities and Exchange Commission acts in consultation with the National Advisory Council on International Monetary and Financial Policies, and they're authorized to suspend the provisions of Section A of the Bretton Woods Agreements Act which provides that securities issued or guaranteed by the World Bank are deemed to be exempt securities under the, under the Securities Act as to any or all securities issued or guaranteed by the World Bank during the period of su such suspension. I hereby certify that the foregoing document was sent to the following this 27th day of May, 2010, and Timothy Geithner was one of them, and uh, there's a whole long list of the people that I sent th this to, including Hillary Clinton uh, as Secretary of State. And when the National Advisory Council didn't do their job and bring the World Bank into compliance, that's when I sent this to the Board of Governors. And I've been working with the Board of Governors ever since. And now we're bringing the World Bank into compliance, finally. And that means that there'll be transparency. And the Board of Governors is going to do what it wants to do with the world's wealth that actually should have been made available in 2005. And we're uh, 10, years, 10 years later, more than 10 years later. And we're finally going to get our inheritance. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity for us. Uh, but we're going to have to, we're going to have to work together in collaboration. I'm going to talk about the United States government at this moment. We are under martial law. General Dunford is the secret military ruler of the United States. P 
people are not given this information. And I have said that uh, the civilian government in the United States, because of this secret, is actually in interregnum. That's because we have a provision in the Constitution of 1789 which provides that when two-thirds of the state legislatures submit an application for amendment that the Congress is required, there's no ends if or buts, they're required to call a constitutional conference to prepare amendments to be considered. And since the Congress has not done this, we do not have a, a legitimate government. This means that we're in a period of time where there is no legitimate government. What we need to do is we need to get that Constitution of 1789 back into force and effect, and then we can con consider what it is that needs amending or doesn't need amending. There's been a lot of hype about whether it's possible to have uh, a, a, a good conference because people are afraid that this network of global corporate control is going to dominate and that people are not going to come up with anything good. But the fact of the matter is where we are right now is martial law. All we need to do is put the Constitution of 1789 into effect and then decide what it is that needs to be improved or not improved. There were some very complex suggestions for revision by the governor of Texas, I found this to be very alarming, very unhelpful, because he wasn't starting out from the place where we all need to start out from, and that is admitting that the Constitution of 1789 is not in effect. The reason why it's not in effect, it has not been in effect since the Civil War, 1861. And then when the Revolutionary War debts came due, in 1871, that's when the bankers put a second secret constitution in effect, and the U.S. Congress every year has dutifully extended a state of emergency without telling anybody. And when I've asked them to admit to this, and I did this in any number of ways, uh, the most, I think, uh, telling way was when I went to the Senate Judiciary Committee because our courts, the Article III courts that we're entitled to under the Constitution, we're not getting. When we go into the federal court, the judge is actually sitting there as an employee of the network of global corporate control, and he is giving us an administrative hearing. It's not an equity court. We're not given the rights that we have under the Constitution the Bill of Rights. They're not recognized in those special courts. They're not actually courts. They're simply administrative procedures. And when I went to the Senate Judiciary Committee and I asked them to admit to this, they wouldn't do that. It's just a big scam on the American public. And that's why we're in interregnum. Very serious. When I brought my lawsuit bought the World Bank bond and went to court. That court was not the one I thought it was. And so when I found out that this was an administrative hearing, I went back to those courts and I asked the clerk of the court how we should proceed to get this rectified. And the clerk said, uh, file some papers with the court. So that's what I did. And the judges ducked the issue, didn't answer whether we were in an Article III court or not. That's when I tried to call the bonds, because all of the bonds, the, the judges, are required to give an oath of office, and those oaths of office are then backed up by bonds issued by surety. That, that's a form of insurance. So I went to the Association of Surety Insurers, and I told that group that we were calling all of the bonds on all of the judges 
because none of the judges were fulfilling their oaths of office. It was a very interesting meeting. <laughs> uh, it sounds preposterous, but it's actually the case. And that's why we're in interregnum. There have been some very alarming activities going on, including what happened in Oregon with the Hammond farm and the, the, the loss of life there. It's just a travesty, but the fact of the matter is we can resolve these problems peacefully. That is what we're entitled to do. And when I say we're entitled to do that, that's because it's really a very um, wonderful situation. We have all of the countries on Earth that are telling this network of global corporate control that they are not entitled to charge us interest on country debt. That's because these banks owe humanity more than we owe them. There were bonds that were issued in the 1930s. They were compounding interest. They're now worth over two quadrillion dollars. So the banks owe us more than we owe them. And of course, when you look at what country debt is, the banks keep the difference between what it costs them to print the currency and the face amount of the bill. And then they call that country debt and they charge countries interest on that. That's a scam. That's worse than a Ponzi scheme. And that is all going to end. It's going to end in a very systematic way without any bloodshed, without any war. Uh, there's going to be a lot of um, transition because if we don't have wars and all of the materials that are used up in wars, then these companies that are making this equipment are going to have to find something else to do. We don't want to throw people out in the street. We don't want them to be jobless. There is a lot that can be done in a productive way, and we're going to have to figure out the best way for the transition. And when I say we, it's not going to be the people in the global debt facility or at the World Bank. It's going to be the people in the various countries who are going to be out from under this terrible oppression, but it's not going to, ha it's not going to be uh, something that's going to lift itself. It's going to be something that people are going to have to recognize in each and every local area. They're going to have to realize who it is that's been holding them back, not to fight these people, not to punish these people, but not, not to let them continue what they, they've been doing. And this also has to do with all of the professions, the accounting profession, the accountants have been complicit with a network of global corporate control. So have the journalists, so have the lawyers. We're going to have to learn how to function ourselves with this, these professions. In terms of the internet, many people are, are now going to the alternative media, but at least 80% of the alternative media is paid for by the network of global corporate control. You can see how their fonts and their graphics are all the same. You, you, you wonder <laughs> how they think that we wouldn't have noticed that at least some of us have noticed that. And it's your job to figure out what the facts are. We learned in one of the earlier episodes that our history and our ancient history has been systematically made up, erased. The, the reality was actually erased. And if you look at the publications, the encyclopedias don't get me started on Wikipedia because Wikipedia, you're not going to find an entry on me in Wikipedia. This is all edited by the Network of Global Corporate Control. I had a fight 
with Wikipedia once. I was trying to get them to recognize what had happened with Robert Selleck. I knew quite well and could f demonstrate what had happened. And there were also some articles on this. Wikipedia would not tell people what really happened. So you're given information that's distorted in the most fundamental ways, your history. All of, all of this information that you have, we're going to have to rewrite. We're going to have to reevaluate. And if we start talking about health, we've mentioned in some of the uh, previous sessions that there's been cures for cancer that were deliberately withheld from us so that we would have to spend money on expensive uh, torture rather than just healing people. So we're going to have a lot of wonderful work as we regain our health using, using information that was withheld from us. It's going to be a very bright future. It's going to be a very prosperous future. But it's also going to be uh, difficult to get from where we are now, where there are people who have been spending a lot of time trying to figure out what the real facts are. But there are many others that are just going to be caught uh, by surprise with this information. And some of them are going to be uh, feeling betrayed because they were. I, I would encourage people who understand what's going on to try to prepare these people because it's going to be a, a rude awakening for many of them. I want to thank you for listening to another segment of the Network of Global Corporate Control. We've discussed in today's segment World Bank Whistleblower for Dummies, how it is that the world's wealth in the global debt facility that was held secret inside the World Bank and Inter International Monetary Fund for 50 years is coming out in a global currency reset to replace paper currencies for currencies out of gold. Until next week, I'm your host, Karen Hudis.